an extraordinary and compelling event. Uh, we're going to start things off with Congressman Tonko offering a few brief remarks. Uh, we have some honored guests uh, that we'll be going to for some introductions and then discussion to follow as a standard with our Faces of series. Uh, if you have questions, uh, members of the media, please feel free to drop them into the chat box or at the very end, uh, we'll just open things up and we can, uh, we can keep things pretty light and uh, we should have some time for questions and uh, I think the Congressman will facilitate at that point. So uh, without further ado, I'm gonna hand things off to Congressman Tonko, Congressman. Hey, thank you, Matt. Good morning, everybody. And thank you for joining us because we have some very powerful messages that will be shared by families today. Um, individuals um, whose children are affected by rare diseases and uh, suffice it to say, these families are tremendously courageous, most loving, and uh, have shared with us their journeys, and they've become the inspiration for legislation that I've introduced. Um, first, let me just welcome our guests, and then I'll explain our legislation. We have joining us from the district, uh, three individuals. We have Melissa Goats, whose daughter, Juliana, um, is been diagnosed with FCS, and I will let them uh, define to their um, whatever measure uh, with the media uh, what the uh, FCS and other uh, 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 rare diseases are all about. So that is Melissa Goats uh, with her daughter Juliana. Then we have Lisa Cariota Carney, whose daughter Olivia um, lives with the Angelman syndrome. And then we have Lori Sames, um, whose daughter Hannah has been diagnosed with GAN. So their stories are tremendously powerful and they're looking for hope. Uh, they're looking for the sort of intervention here from the federal agencies so as to uh, best have uh, that hope as it relates to either effective and affordable treatments or in the form of cures. So we have developed the HEART Act, Helping Experts Accelerate Rare Treatments Act. The HEART Act would um, involve itself with the, uh, uh, with the FDA. Uh, it addresses some 7,000 rare diseases that impact a staggering 30 million people, 30 million Americans. And um, there really is a need, I believe, to be much more vigilant um, about uh, providing a response to these individuals and their families. Uh, we would require through the HEART Act that the risk evaluation and mitigation strategy necessarily incorporate uh, the families. What's an interesting side light here is that these families uh, compile tremendous data and information. And um, they become uh, probably one of the best sources uh, of information so as to aid in the efforts by the agency to uh, move toward a cure or again, more effective or affordable treatments. So it involves, uh, it would require that formal involvement and, in, and partnership with the families as they do their risk evaluation and mitigation strategy. Then there are sections of the world that have devoted uh, more focus uh, to combating rare diseases. So our bill would require G the GAO uh, to uh, put together um, a partnership or at least review what the EU, for instance, is doing. And within the EU setting in that framework of, of, uh, of countries, there is some progress. And again, sound attention being paid uh, rare diseases. So we would require that that, that that review with the EU be ongoing and that there be formal reports on an annual basis as to the progress or uh, what the annual uh, experience has been uh, that's shared by FDA. Um, this, I think, puts a structure into the process and allows people to have a better shot at realizing uh, treatment or uh, cures that would um, uh, enable the families to uh, sense that, uh, that needed hope uh, that would respond to their children. Um, this action, this HEART Act, 
is perhaps some of the greatest progress to come in some 38 years since the Orphan Drug Act had been passed, which uh, began the first focus on rare diseases. But I think we must and we can do better. Uh, and so it's important for us to drive this effort so as to uh, structure a response for on behalf of the families. Again, their testimony, their, uh, their, their stories related to us are very powerful, powerful sentiments that enable us to uh, be a more sensitive um, uh, bit of federal government that uh, would take to heart and mind uh, their struggles and truly work in the best and most effective way for progress. Um, the bill that I've um, authored and, and uh, have introduced as a sponsor is co-sponsored by um, Representative David McKinley of, of West Virginia. Ironically, I just returned this weekend from a couple days of visit in West Virginia with Representative McKinley in an effort uh, to have a bipartisan experience. I traveled throughout many communities that he represents, heard from the people about all sorts of issues. Um, he is the ranker on the subcommittee uh, that I chair, the subcommittee on environment and climate change. And um, it's our effort to try and build stronger relationships so that we can be more productive in Washington. So it's ironic that he is our co-sponsor on this legislation. And I thank Representative McKinley for that partnership. Um, with that, I think it's so important that you hear from our guests. They can give you the real sense and the spirit and the heart of uh, what drives this legislation. So Melissa, why don't we start with you? Melissa is uh, also co-president of the FCS Foundation, which she has put together in order to uh, have that support that's essential. And again, uh, she's here speaking to the needs of her daughter, Juliana. Melissa? Thank you so much. Um, thank you for, for putting this together and for allowing us to share our story. It, it's so meaningful um, for us to be able to do that. And I just wanna say thank you first and foremost to you, Congressman, and to your staff who have been so supportive of the FC FCS Foundation. Um, and our experience with the FDA and this legislation since day one, it, it means so much to us and it gives us so much hope that there is progress that we can make and, and we really appreciate that. My um, pleasure. <laughs> Uh, my daughter Juliana uh, was born in 2012, and in 2013, uh, we were in the hospital. She had a liver infection, a kidney infection, and uh, pancreatitis, and her triglycerides were 28,000. So for reference, uh, triglycerides should be around 500. Her blood was uh, bubblegum pink. So we found out then that she had this ultra rare disease. It's one in a million called FCS. And as most mothers do when their children are diagnosed with anything, they do a deep dive into whatever research they can find. And there was nothing. Um, there was no supporting community. There was no research. There was nothing. And it felt very alone and isolating for a very long time until I met my co-president, Lindsay, in 2015. And we met and it, you know, finding that community is so life-changing. And that's how we started the FCS Foundation. So there is currently no treatment for FCS. Um, there was a, a potential drug um, that went for review with the FDA that was not approved, which um, sort of sparked this conversation for us uh, and the importance of this legislation. Once we realized this was not an isolated FCS issue that a lot of rare disease groups were coming up against this, um, you know, trying to get drugs approved within the FDA, uh, we realized how important this was. And, you know, it's really just about understanding the rare disease community. I think the FDA does a really great job and, and we really look forward to having a great working relationship with them. Um, but we think that there's just some things about rare disease that are, are unique. You know, small sample studies uh, can be hard and finding patients to enroll in studies and understanding what rare patients are willing to do for risk benefit, um, you know, that's, that's different than it's gonna look for the larger community. Okay, th Melissa, thank you. Or do you have more that you want to share or we- No, that's, uh, that's it for we'll now. I, I figured that was a good- <laughs> Okay, no, very, 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 <laughs> very well done. Um, next, we have Lisa Cariota Harney, whose daughter, Olivia, uh, has been diagnosed with Angelman uh, syndrome. So 
Lisa, you could share your story with us, please. Sure. And again, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. And Melissa asked me to um, come in and speak a little bit about Olivia as well. But Olivia's syndrome is uh, one in 30,000 and she was diagnosed at nine months old. I was a special um, needs teacher in Albany and I knew something was wrong from the beginning. She wasn't babbling, she wasn't sitting up, she wasn't meeting the milestones. So um, like Melissa said, it is, it's heartbreaking to hear anything about a child, let alone a syndrome that your child may not walk, will not talk. Right now, after 16 years, we are on a committee um, called FAST, and it's a program, it's an uh, organization for Angelman syndrome, and we are working on a cure, um, but they haven't came out with the, uh, the drug. I, I think they're going through the spinal. I, I'm not quite sure how they're doing this yet or if it's medication, but Olivia has been in many studies in Boston and in New York City for a, a cure, trying to just close the gap of a, because Olivia's deletion is a deletion on a gene of a chromosome. So they were trying to close the gap of this uh, gene. So right now we're just kind of waiting and seeing if there will be a cure, if medicine will be able to um, help, even just with her saying a few words or with her seizures, um, and with her gait, the way she walks. So hopefully with this new heart act, if it gets passed, we'll be able to find a cure or have someone help in the community. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. And uh, finally, we have Lori Sains, um, whose daughter, Hannah, Hannah, excuse me, um, has been diagnosed with GAN. Uh, Lori, if you just could tell us a bit about Hannah. Again, we've talked to all three moms and they tell us their daughters are managing. So that's good to hear. But uh, tell us about Hannah, please, Lori. Yeah, Hannah was diagnosed um, with giant axonal neuropathy or GAN in March of 2008. Uh, she had just turned four and uh, it's neurodegenerative. Um, uh, we basically uh, picked ourselves up off the ground and decided to fight. And we established Hannah's Hope Fund. Thankfully, we were able to raise um, millions of dollars, uh, initially 6 million to fund the first in human gene therapy to the central nervous system. That clinical study started in March of, uh, actually in May of 2015. And we had money, our foundation, Hannah's Hope Fund, had money for everything, uh, toxicology studies, the first batch of human grade vector for the clinical trial. We didn't have money to pay for a clinical trial, even though GAN is ultra rare. Um, I know of about 100 cases around the world. The National Institutes of Health in uh, NINDS did take on the clinical study. Um, sadly, it's moved at a glacial pace. Uh, I believe just 12 patients have been injected since uh, 2015. Um, so, you know, we are using the Bayesian method of biostatistical analysis. So when you have such a small patient sampling and um, ethically you can't do a first in human gene therapy clinical trial with a lumbar puncturing kids, with a placebo arm. So thankfully there was a great rational approach to that. So the kids data pre-treatment um, taken at different intervals as the disease progresses um, in a natural history study, those data sets are compared to the post-treatment data sets. So we're really hoping that, um, you know, the, the data is pretty powerful with such a small sampling for that intervention, but that intervention is just uh, targeting mostly the lower motor neurons in the central nervous system. GAN is a, is a disease of every nerve cell in the body. We also have a drug discovery program underway. Dr. Natasha Snyder at UNC at Chapel Hill is our principal investigator leading that effort. We actually have three drugs that are already FDA approved that we hope to repurpose. Um, one of them, um, miraculously, my daughter's already on because it was part of an immunomodulation protocol that she received prior to receiving the gene therapy back in 2016. Um, we've done um, preclinical studies with 
that drug and um, in different models. And uh, we believe it's very efficacious for our disease. It, that drug off label would be a $1,300 a month per patient. It's um, the drug has been around for decades. And so we do have to do a, a small study. Obviously our sampling is very small um, to hopefully get that drug approved and the other drugs approved to help our disease. So this act is critically needed. Um, the rare disease space, these gene therapies take a very long time to develop. They don't apply to many different types of genetic disorders, whereas drug screens, and especially if you can get a win with a repurposed drug um, that already has a good safety profile, we need an avenue with such small patient populations with limited funds to be able to show efficacy and without a placebo arm. We don't have the numbers for a placebo arm. We need to take those patients pre-treatment data sets and compare them to those post-treatment data sets and a rational approach to looking at what risk benefit is for the ultra rare because it's far different than what these drugs are used for less severe, um, less, much less traumatic, popular diseases that they were originally approved for. Thank you, Lori. So perhaps a question to any of the three of you, to Lori, Lisa, or Melissa. Um, what's the biggest difference that you can imagine that would come into your lives with the passage of the heart act? I would envision a, um, a very close collaboration with an arm of the FDA that fully understands risk benefit for my disease. When we had our pre-investigational new drug meeting with the FDA for our gene therapy, I showed video clips, um, snippets from a two-year-old to a 22-year-old. And in that moment, they understood risk benefit for my disease. So I think there needs to be a collaborative effort because we can't expect them to know the intricacies or the dramatic impact of you know, 7,000 different rare diseases. So mm -hmm. there needs to be a new model. And I think this is a great avenue to help implement a new model. Great, thank you. And um, any other comments from? I, I think to echo exactly that, you know, when we when we went through the process with the FDA for our, the previous drug, you know, we we did the patient led meetings, we participated in the advisory committee hearing, um, but there was still sort of a disconnect between their understanding of what it truly meant to live with this ultra rare um, disease. And at one point in the advisory committee hearing, um, one of the risks was low platelets, and they said, "Well, you're just substituting." one, you know, one thing for another, meaning low platelets for pancreatitis. And that to me was just the biggest moment where I said, they don't understand our disease um, right. because the risk of, of low platelets is not the same as knowing our patients are going to wake up month after month in the hospital with pancreatitis. Um, so really being able to have that dialogue with them of understanding what it means to live with a rare disease um, and that impact every single day of living with chronic pain or you know, social anxiety and all the things that come with it, um, that will change what our patients are willing to tolerate in terms of treatment. Mm -hmm. Anything else? So it's really establishing that dialogue and making certain that uh, awareness is struck right. uh, as to uh, some of the very detailed and uh, uh, Dynamic, the dynamics that could make a difference uh, are understood. So, um, okay. And so, you know, the, the fact that um, many of these rare diseases uh, largely impact children, um, were you surprised by that fact? Uh, the more you began to learn about your own child's situation? Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, there was just like Melissa, there was not an investigator in the world funded to study my daughter's disease when she was diagnosed. It was just unbelievable to me that there's these horrific childhood disorders that just no one knows about them and no one's working on them. It was horrifying. And then when we um, 
We held the world's first, first symposium for GAN less than three months after Hannah was diagnosed. We brought Dr. Stephen Gray, a young research associate in Jude Zamulski's lab at UNC at Chapel Hill. He came to our symposium to learn about our disease and to see if they had anything going on in the gene therapy center that they thought could impact our disease. And then, you know, maybe nine months later, we had data and we thought, okay, this could, this could be it. And it was a complete feeling of panic because what was stopping us was money. Um, thankfully, our community here in upstate New York, they, you know, rallied around Hannah's Hope Fund and helped us, helped us raise the money. But yeah, it's isolating and terrifying. Um, and, and anyone else want to... Uh... Well, I think I think to that point too. Um, you know, it's hard to encourage some of these um, cl clinicians and these and these companies to want to invest in rare disease. Also, looking at, you know, having been through the process, looking how difficult it can be to prove with a small sample study that a drug that a drug is effective. Um, you know. It, these are these are companies, you know, and, and I'm not they're looking to make money by by developing these drugs, you know, and that's that doesn't offend me. Um, but I think it's difficult for them to want to commit to these small populations when, you know, you look down and there's so many you look down the path and there, there can be so many potential hurdles because there isn't an understanding of how important it is that these drugs get approval. Um, yeah. Yeah. Assuming their efficacy and their safety and all of those things. Right. And, and just how easy or how difficult is it to find the right treatment um, for, for these diseases? It, it's very difficult. I mean, it's, it's harder than finding a needle in a haystack. I mean, the underlying disease mechanisms of all of these are usually quite unique. The hope that, you know, we have is we find a drug that will, for example, enhance axonal transport. So therefore it wouldn't just work for GAN, it would work for any type of neuropathy that impacts the axon versus the myelin portion of the nerve. So we all, you know, when we meet with our scientific advisors, we look for something sexy that has greater implications than just our small disease to try to pique the interest of industry to want to invest in it because it would be more impactful and thus, you know, make more money for shareholders. Um, mm -hmm. But it's tough. Yeah. Well, you know, each of you in speaking with you um, have this obvious dedication and devotion uh, to your children and their cause, uh, their medical need. Um, and obviously the, the accumulated information and data that you uh, routinely compile mm -hmm. become significant in that uh, equation for success. But something like this, the, um, what does the promise of new treatment mean to your families? Obviously you're wrapped into this totally, but uh, what can you put into words what it means? I, I think for us, and I'll, it means hope, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. because for me to be able to talk to Juliana and to tell her, um, she recently started to experience one of the side effects of the disease, which is uh, xanthomas on her body. It's basically the fat in her body is, is trying to find somewhere to go. Um, and so we were talking about it and, and I'm like, you know, we're, we're working on it. We're working on these clinical trials and we're working on finding something. And I think just being able to share that with her and for her to think like, okay, people are paying attention and they care and that hope it, it, it helps. It helps to just kind of continue on with your day. Otherwise, it feels like, you know, you don't know what's going to happen. Right. And, and for us, it, it's um, quality of life. Anything mm -hmm. that can help with, you know, having a better quality of life. It's, it's not about quantity. It's about quality. Right. You know, right. It's the about quality of life for everybody in that picture, in that frame. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's about, you know, for Juliana, it's like not having to miss a birthday party because you're in the hospital. <laughs> you, know, you know, things that things we take for granted. Yeah. Um, yeah. And if, if there were a message that you would share with members of Congress, with my colleagues, um, what would it be? Uh, a, a message on behalf of those families and certainly the, the children living with rare diseases. I would say that um, 
you know, in terms of, of why this bill is so important, you know, the, the FDA is doing a good job. They're doing the best that they can, but this is a real problem that exists and that it's something that we need to look at and work on and be practical about. And that's exactly what I think the five points here do. And doing that will really help increase the ability for for effective and safe drugs to be approved for our rare disease communities to give them that hope because they need it. And right now, you know, it, it's just not, it's not flowing the way um, it should be, or it's supposed to be. You know, I think the FDA will say that they have these things in place already, but I can tell you from my experience and from speaking with other rare disease groups, uh, it is not working the way it's intended to work. So these things help, I think, strengthen what the FDA already wants to do. It's just really holding everyone accountable to that. Right. And with, and with the intellect of, that obviously is part of this nation, that intellectual capacity needs to be tapped into in the most effective way so that um, we can move this along as quickly as possible. Yeah, in partnership. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, I think bioethicists sometimes have tunnel vision and um, can be very stubborn and day in, day in the life, uh, you know, just walk in our shoes and these patients' shoes just one day and you'd have mm -hmm. a whole different perspective on risk benefit. And it really needs to be in partnership because they'll never understand unless they're shown and told, um, and then they'll appreciate risk benefit for these horrific diseases. You know, I think, you know, you've just highlighted why uh, it's so essential that patients and their families be part of the, uh, of the process. Yeah. Uh, their, that their information, their stories telling is incredibly important and, and just the, uh, uh, the overall, <laughs> compilation of data. Now, one thing I want to get into because we're all, you know, dealing with the impact of COVID. Uh, so many people have had family members, loved ones, neighbors, whatever, um, pass with the COVID um, virus. And uh, the crisis has influenced many people. Um, has there been an impact on you and your loved ones? Oh, yeah. Um, Hannah and I were in lockdown probably two weeks before it hit our area, you know, we were told it's, it's in your area before you, you get confirmed cases. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, you know, that would be horrific for anyone with an underlying condition. So yeah, it uh, completely changed the way we live. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, once we got vaccinated, um, our world opened up again. Mm -hmm. no, that, that's a great question because I think there's an element that people don't think about. So Juliana has to have a really low fat diet, about 10 to 15 grams of fat a day. Uh, a tablespoon of olive oil has 12 grams of fat to put in perspective. So she has a diet of, uh, you know, lean protein, some pasta, beans, things that were not in grocery stores in March and April of 2020. And when I tell you the anxiety that I felt of how I would feed her, <laughs> because it still makes me upset, um, things that she could eat, I could not find in the grocery stores. I was having my friends at any supermarket to buy me packs of chicken, um, lean, you know, beans. And to this day, I still like hoard in my basement now um, and in our freezer because I can't just feed her anything, you know, um, or she'll be sick. And the worst, the last place I wanted her to be, you know, in April and May of 2020 was in the hospital um, mm -hmm. or any time. But, you know, so the food, there was food insecurity around her rare disease of how am I going to feed her and keep her healthy and not have access to basic things that are in the supermarkets. And I think I remember thinking like if if, you know, the, the, pan, the people I spoke with at the FDA knew how this felt right now and how terrifying this is. Um, you know, we, we have to eat and I don't know if I'm always gonna have options for her. There you go. Laurie, are you looking to contribute? I think you are. I'm, I'm um, no, you know, um, I just, you know, I think the lockdown was just very hard on everyone, but just to hear Melissa and Juliana's 
uh, you know, story of that COVID impact. And yeah, these rare diseases are awful. I didn't even consider, you know, someone like Juliana during COVID and it's horrific. Yeah. And I know there was food insecurity with our, our, our other patients too. You know, we were sharing creative recipes online with one another. Like how can we use, you know, canned tuna or like whatever we can get our hands on. How can we make this into a, a meal that will meet our dietary needs? Um, and it was, you know, it was a strange impact <laughs> that I didn't see coming. Mm-hmm. Lisa, any other thoughts? Well, I, and here I'm thinking, I, I was just saying to myself about with Olivia with, because she has such, um, anxiety with, um, like sensory issues. I couldn't bring her out to the community because she wouldn't wear a mask. And everywhere I went, I kept getting yelled at, even though I had a uh, doctor's note, they kept saying that she wasn't allowed in stores or out. Um, I remember trying to wheel her in a wheelchair through Colony Center one day, and they told me she couldn't come in because she wouldn't wear a mask. So it took me eight months to finally get her to wear a mask. So simple things like that. Plus she didn't understand, obviously what is going on in the world and she loves to hug people. That's part of her syndrome. So she couldn't, she wasn't allowed to hug, wasn't allowed to touch anybody, wasn't allowed to see our family. So it was definitely a, it was definitely a change. Right, and it could uh, result in setbacks, I would think. And, right, uh, and that, that, of that. You know, the, pa- the patterns for them may be very important. Right, because they're so set in their ways and then she wasn't going to school, so. Right. So, uh, Matt, perhaps we should see if we have any questions from our media folks. Great. Thank you, Congressman. And thank you, uh, of course, to our participants. Uh, If anybody uh, from the media who's assembled here uh, has a question, you can feel free to just unmute yourself and and ask away. Or again, feel free to drop a question into chat and, and we'll get to your question. Yes, hi, um, I have a question. This is uh, Bethany Bump from the Albany Times Union. Um, I'm hoping uh, maybe Congressman, you can clarify this for me or one of the parents here, but I'm trying to understand, is there currently no avenue for family to provide input or to collaborate with the FDA when it does do this risk evaluation and mitigation or is it just not given uh, enough weight when they actually make their decisions? I'm, I'm happy to. Yeah, why do, I think this is best answered by you folks because you live it front line. Um, so uh, this is, it's Melissa. Um, so there is, there are avenues in place. You know, there are patient led meetings. Um, there are opportunities for groups to come in and share their story. Um, what, what we found was, uh, I don't know how heavy weight it carried, because the, the, if you had heard our patient testimonies at the advisory committee hearing, and if you had heard what they had to say about their, their willingness for risk benefit and, and what they tolerated on a daily basis, um, I would have, you, I was very surprised that the FDA could have heard that testimony and still um, came back with what they came back with in terms of um, the drug, the, the REMS risk evaluation mitigation being too burdensome or um, you know, platelets, low platelets being the same as pancreatitis. Uh, to me, that meant that they really weren't listening. And we reached out to the FDA, the FCS Foundation did, after um, the drug was not approved to say, how can we work together? How can we continue to share? Because our hope was that this was not the last time we would, we would work with the FDA, that there would be additional clinical trials. And so we said, what can we do you know, to work with you so that the next time a drug comes before you, you really understand our disease state. And what we essentially got was a, well, thank you, but we'll be in touch. And that was two and a half years ago and they have not been in touch. (laughs) So there are things in place and they're just not, I I don't think that patients are really, what they're saying is not really being taken into consideration. Yeah. So Bethany, I think it's fair to say that while it's authorized or uh, made available, we would like to see it required yeah, because that partnership is so bold and so meaningful and so um, instructive. Required that, uh, that they incorporate the family input into their decision or required yes. that they listen? Because it, it sounds like they've been listening. They're just not, they're doing not 
operating. You know, okay. for example, we had to we had to specifically request that a rare disease expert be at one of our listening sessions. Um, we got the agenda beforehand and we saw that no one with rare disease experience was even going to be in that meeting with us. And that was a big red flag for us because how were they making sense of our, our information. Um, the division that looks at FCS is the same division that looks at diabetes. And those are two totally different disease states. Mm -hmm. So we felt like someone from rare disease had to sit in on that meeting and we were surprised we had to request it specifically. And what if we hadn't known to do so? Yeah, Lisa or Lori, is there anything you would want to add to what Melissa said in response to Bethany? I haven't had direct contact yet um, with the FDA for um, a, a drug other than the, the biologic that I previously mentioned that's still in, um, it's the pivotal phase two is starting. Um, but I, I guess it's there, the FDA has the final say, but there has to be an objection period um, you know, you can declare a mistrial. So I think that there needs to be an avenue in this situation, like Melissa has spoken about, where like, you got it wrong on this one, you know, um, because we're ultra rare and because this is horrific and because the patients are willing to tolerate this, you know, X, Y, and Z. But there's no avenue for that. The gavel's been slammed and it just, there's no gavel in rare disease. Nice. You know, it needs, there needs to be an avenue for retrial for rare disease when they miss it because no one's perfect. And Lisa, anything? No, because I, unfortunately, with Olivia's um, syndrome, there hasn't been a drug per se to help with her syndrome. Um, so I really don't have too much to say about that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any other questions from our uh, partners in the media? I do have another, but I can take turns. Um, Matt, what do we, do we have anyone? Else, we, have a, we have a few other folks here, um, but I think, Bethany, if you want to go ahead with your question. Sure, thank you. Um, so my other question has to do with the piece of this legislation that um, is in regards to the EU review that this would require. So I was wondering, it, it, are, is the US, is the FDA currently reviewing anything out of the EU when it comes to rare diseases, or are they just not doing it on a regular basis? I, I can speak to that. Okay. All of that. Um, so that 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 piece, um, you know, we see as really important because what we have found, and this includes the drug that that we had potentially available to us, as well as when we were talking to other rare disease groups, is that there are drugs available. That drug was, has now been approved in the EU. So our um, community who lives in Europe has access to the drug that was not approved here in the United States, um, which is kind of tough because that means that there are people living with this disease who are getting relief and then there are people who are not. And so what we'd like to do is to have that study and then to also be able to use the data being collected um, to help you know, like Lori said, for that that retrial, you know, to say, okay, our, our sample sizes are small here in the US, just by nature of rare disease, we can't create more people with this disease. Um, so if we use the data of people using the drug in the in Europe, uh, can we use that to then come back and say, look, like we've been using this drug for another two years and look at the look at the data? Um, can, can we reconsider and, and use that data here to get this drug approved? Thank you very much. That was, um, those were my questions, but I want to thank you guys for sharing your stories. Thank you. Thank you. And Bethany, as you're going through this, if you have additional questions about some of the, some of the policy pieces, feel free to follow up with us uh, and we can make sure to connect you with, uh, with the resources. Will do, thank you. Hey Matt, anyone else? 
I'll repeat the question. If anybody else has a, has a question, again, feel free to type in the chat box or just unmute uh, and ask away. We'll give it just a minute to see if there are any lingering questions. All right, hearing none, as I just said uh, to Bethany, uh, if you do have additional questions uh, or would like to follow up for, for any additional resources, please don't hesitate to reach out to our team. Uh, you can reach me at matt, M-A-T-T -T, dot S, at mail, M-A-I-L dot house dot gov. Uh, and, uh, or you can just hit reply to one of my or Rachel's emails. Uh, to wrap things up, I'll hand things back to you, Congressman. Okay, uh, well, before I make any closing comments, uh, do any of our three guests, have any closing thoughts that they have? I, if I can, um, I know I feel like I, I'm talking a lot, um, but as you can see, I'm very passionate about this. This means so much to me um, and to, to Juliana, they see me working and it's, I, I love being able to tell them what I'm doing. Um, you know, they want to know why I was dressed up today because for the last year they've seen, <laughs> me, they've seen me in sweatshirts and you know, whatever. So to be able to tell them what I was doing this morning is, is so important to me. Um, you know, we would love to be able uh, to, to let the committee know how important this is and, and to see this get passed this year. You know, we've been working since 2018 and we would love to see this get passed and we would so appreciate um, Congressman if your willingness to talk to Chairman Pallone about why this is so important. Sure. And, and why this Absolutely. is asked. So we, we really yes. appreciate your help. And yeah, you know, oh, my pleasure. I've been so entrenched on the, the biologic side of um, biomedical research and knowing that we need to do three trials on, you know, to try to repurpose three already approved drugs, knowing that this act could possibly be passed is just bringing sunshine, I mean, and hope, and it's, it's critically needed. Thank you. Well, and anything, uh, Lisa, that you wanted to mention? No, oh, I'm just glad I was able to be invited on this committee to see and hear everyone's stories. Sure. And now sure. we're not alone. Look, it's, um, it's, it's understood, obviously. It's very apparent that, you know, the challenge is great. It's awesome in your lives. And uh, the love that you have for uh, your child, uh, for your children, and the outright devotion and dedication to make a difference uh, just feeds your passion. That's so evident. Um, and my best response to that is to do everything I can to communicate with my colleagues, with Chairman Pallone, with the committee, to make certain that people understand not only the, the, the value added here, uh, the hope that we can deliver, uh, but the sense of urgency that wraps um, this whole issue. Um, so I just thank you for being the inspiration here. Um, your, your, command of the of the situation and your need here um, is something we should all take into mind and to heart and um, you know I think it's the spirit of community that should govern our democracy that when one amongst us hurts we should all feel that pain and I think that's when we're at our best so I thank you for inspiring us to be our best and uh, we'll do all we can uh, to provide hope and, uh, and let those little ones who are looking at you saying, why did you get dressed up today? <laughs> know that it's not all about I'm them. I'm sorry, I didn't. <laughs> yeah, that it's all about them. And you know what? That's a good thing. So thank you one and all for joining us. And, uh, and I wish us all luck as we go forward. I wish us success. Yeah. Um, okay. All you're asking for is commitment here, and that is a fair thing. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Bye. everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.